1 to 5 reps for maximum strength, 6 to 12 reps for hypertrophy, and 12 or more reps for muscle endurance. Are things really that simple? Is the hypertrophy rep range even a thing? Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here with you today with Strong by Science, breaking down the latest research on how many reps to do per set to maximize muscle growth. To start answering that question, let's first look at a review paper by Schoenfeld and colleagues from 2021. In this paper, they broke down all the evidence on different rep ranges for both hypertrophy and strength. They had a few interesting findings when it came to hypertrophy. Specifically, there appears to be both a bottom and a top threshold for the maximally effective intensity range. Ultimately, how heavy you go closely corresponds to how many repetitions you'll be performing on a set per set basis. And so, at least on average, any percentage of your max has a rep range equivalent. In this review paper, they looked at things from a percentage or a max basis. And what they found is that between 30% of your max and 85% of your max, hypertrophy was similar. Let's break down the evidence for both of those thresholds. First, 30% of your max. The idea that you want to go with at least 30% of your max for hypertrophy comes from three studies. One study by Buckner and colleagues, one study by Lasevichius and colleagues, and one study by Mitchell and colleagues. First, in a 2020 study by Buckner and colleagues, they compared using 70% of your max to using only 15% of your max using a unilateral bicep curl exercise. No matter whether or not participants used blood flow restriction or occlusion training, 70% of your max did lead to more hypertrophy compared to using only 15% of your max. So it seems that if you go too light, say close to 15%, that may not be as effective as going at least a little bit heavier. Second, a study by Lasevichius and colleagues from 2018 compared 20% to 40% to 60% to 80% of your max using a within participant design. In this study, they looked at the bicep curl and the unilateral leg press, wherein one limb was always trained with 20% of your max for three sets, and then the other limb was assigned to either a 40%, 60%, or 80% of your one rep max training protocol. Although they always did three sets with one of their limbs, say their left arm and their left leg, they matched for volume load, meaning they usually did more sets with 40 or 60 or 80% of their max to make up for differences in volume load. To illustrate, if with their 20% of their max limb, they were able to get to 1000 kilograms of volume load on the bicep curl exercise, they then did as many sets as needed to also reach 1000 kilograms of volume load with their other limb that was assigned to either the 40, 60, or 80% of their max condition. Broadly speaking, they found more favorable hypertrophy when using 80% of their max compared to 20% of their max. Importantly though, it is difficult to say whether that difference was purely due to doing more sets or whether 20% is truly too light as far as maximizing hypertrophy. And finally, for the third study, we have a study by Mitchell and colleagues. Once again, using a within participant design where one limb was trained with one weight and the other with another weight, they compared using 30% of your max to 80% of your max in the single legged leg extension. And in this case, they found similar hypertrophy of the quad muscles when using 30 versus 80% of your max. From these three studies, the recommendation was made by Schoenfeld and colleagues that you should use at least 30% of your max when it comes to maximizing muscle growth from any given set. Indeed, in the study by Mitchell and colleagues, we saw the same hypertrophy with 30 versus 80% of your max. However, in my opinion, the effective threshold might be even a little bit lower than 30%, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, we are basing this recommendation off of only three studies. So we would need more data before being very certain about 30% being the threshold. And second, as I mentioned, in this study by Lasevichius and colleagues, they specifically were performing more sets when going heavier, which is a confounder and potentially, had they done the same number of hard sets, they would have seen the same hypertrophy from 20 versus 40 versus 60 versus 80% of their max. But at the very least, at this stage, a reasonable takeaway from this research is that the bottom threshold for maximally effective intensities lies somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 30% of your max. So we know there's a bottom threshold. What about the top threshold? Is there such a thing as going too heavy and doing too few reps per set? Well, we have around five studies, to my knowledge, that have compared very low rep ranges of below about five to higher rep ranges. The first is a study by Schoenfeld and colleagues that compared three sets of 10 with 90 seconds of rest to seven sets of three with three minutes of rest. And in this study, they found similar hypertrophy with these two approaches. However, a big limitation is that they spent about two and a half times as much time doing seven sets of three versus three sets of 10. The rest times were twice as long and they did over twice as many sets overall. And indeed, in contrast to these findings by Schoenfeld, another study by the same research group found that doing three sets of eight to 12 repetitions with two minutes rest resulted in similar or slightly better growth depending on the site 
to three sets of two to four reps with two minutes rest. In contrast, another study by Manjin and colleagues found greater hypertrophy, broadly speaking, when doing three sets of three to five reps compared to three sets of 10 to 12 reps. The fourth study is a study by Mattox and colleagues, which was essentially looking at the effect of doing heavy singles compared to more traditional hypertrophy style training. They compared doing four to five singles per session with 90 seconds rest to doing four sets of eight to 12 reps with 90 seconds rest as well. The exercises performed were the machine chest press and the leg extension on isokinetic dynamometer. At all of the sites measured for hypertrophy, the effect sizes leaned in favor of the group performing higher rep training and not just doing singles. And interestingly, the group that just performed singles actually saw slight decreases in muscle size from before the study to after the study. This is actually notable because the participants were untrained. And so at the very least, it seems that maybe going super low in reps and just doing singles is unlikely to be ideal for hypertrophy. Similarly, another study by Carvalho and colleagues that had a multi-phase design where the first three weeks were essentially a comparison of a strength-based routine and a hypertrophy-based routine found better hypertrophy when following more of a hypertrophy-based routine. In this study, they looked at the squat and the leg press exercise, comparing four sets of one to three reps with three minutes of rest in the strength group to four sets of eight to 12 reps with 60 seconds of rest in the hypertrophy group. And to make a long story short, as far as vastus lateralis muscle thickness increases went, the hypertrophy group saw larger increases. And that was in spite of resting for three times less time between sets. And so when you put all of these five studies together that have compared higher rep training, say five or six reps or above, to lower rep training, say five reps or below, generally the picture does emerge that you want to be doing at least five reps per set if you want to be pretty confident that you're maximizing muscle growth on any given set. If you've been paying close attention, you might have noticed that I mentioned 30% of your max as a rough guideline for how light you could go and still maximize hypertrophy. And if you're astute, you might be asking, how many reps is that, Mr. Science Man? Fortunately for you, a meta-analysis by Nuzo and colleagues looked at exactly this question and found that with around 30% of your max, on average across different exercises, different muscle groups, different training statuses, you can perform around 50 repetitions, although there is some variance from exercise to exercise and population to population. And if you think the effective threshold starts even lower than that, around 20%, depending on how you interpret the findings by Lasavikius and colleagues, you might be looking at even more than 50 reps. But at the very least, what this tells us is that we want to be doing at least five reps per set to maximize hypertrophy, all the way up to at least 50, and that is the effective or maximally effective hypertrophy rep range. And based on this research, the eight to 12 or six to 12 hypertrophy rep range is in fact needlessly narrow. Now you could say, all right, I'm just gonna do sets of five then, or just sets of 20, or even just sets of 50 if you're into calisthenics, for example. However, if you want to maximize hypertrophy, there are some findings out there suggesting that you want to include a variety of rep ranges to maximize your growth. Specifically, an in-house meta-analysis performed by Zach Robinson suggests that when comparing just doing one rep range to doing a variety of rep ranges in your program, there's some preliminary evidence that using a variety could offer some slight advantages in terms of how much muscle mass you grow. Now, to address a commonly asked question, let me talk about fiber types and how that can influence or potentially not influence how many reps you should be using while training for hypertrophy. There's been a couple of review papers looking at the effects of different rep ranges for specifically slower muscle twitch fiber growth and faster twitch muscle fiber growth. First, one review paper looking at the effects of different rep ranges on fiber one versus fiber two type growth found that there might be some evidence in favor of different rep ranges for different fiber types. However, the study designs being used to investigate this question are not of the highest quality. And indeed, the authors even noted, while some evidence indicates that low load resistance training when carried out to failure may induce a greater hypertrophic response in type one muscle fibers compared to high load resistance training, and that high load resistance training may induce preferential growth of type 2 muscle fibers, the body of literature remains somewhat equivocal on the topic. In summary, there currently is not enough evidence to make a firm conclusion regarding changes that occur at the muscle fiber level with different loading schemes. In general, the evidence on this topic is pretty heterogeneous. It's difficult to draw conclusions. What we do know is that training with different loads, say a heavier load and a lighter load, seem to lead to pretty similar hypertrophy within that effective rep range or intensity range I mentioned earlier. And when it comes specifically to lower loads causing more slow twitch fiber growth and higher loads causing more fast twitch fiber growth, the evidence is still relatively lacking at this point. If you wanted to make a probabilistic argument that you want to include a variety of rep ranges in your program to both target the faster twitch and the slower twitch fibers optimally, 
there is room for that. As I mentioned earlier, just from a whole muscle perspective, using a variety of rep ranges is likely the safer bet and may even offer a tiny bit more growth. But when it comes specifically to higher reps, targeting slower twitch fibers better and growing them more, the evidence is still quite mixed. If such an effect does exist, it is quite limited in scope. Another review paper specifically on the effects of occlusion training and lighter and heavier loads found broadly speaking similar findings. Here's what the authors had to say. Magnitude of type one fiber hypertrophy is at least as great and sometimes greater than type two hypertrophy when performing low load blood flow restriction training. This finding is in contrast to high load training where the magnitude of type two fiber hypertrophy tends to be substantially greater than that of type one myofibers. However, as they go on to note in the paper, there are not many studies comparing low load occluded training where you use bands to occlude the venous blood flow away from the limb to just regular low load training or even just regular high load training. So it's difficult to say whether it's the rep range and the lighter load being used or whether it's simply the application of the occlusion modality. And so yet again, the evidence is still not entirely clear. So should you use different rep ranges based on how fast twitch or slow twitch you think you are or different muscles are? In my opinion, no. Should you still be using a variety of rep ranges if your aim is to maximize hypertrophy? In my opinion, yes even if it doesn't cause more hypertrophy. And there is some evidence that it does cause more hypertrophy, but even if it doesn't, generally using a variety of rep ranges in your training is just more enjoyable. Variety is the spice of life. Additionally, if nothing else, certain exercises just tend to work out better in certain rep ranges. If you've ever tried to do sets of 20 on squats, first of all, please get help. But second of all, it will also have helped you realize that maybe certain exercises work better in certain rep ranges. Maybe more compound movements are best kept in the lower rep ranges of say 5 to 12, or maybe even 5 to 15, whereas more isolation style movements like leg extensions, bicep curls, calf raises, etc. can be pretty easily done in higher rep ranges and be more fun getting a nicer pump. And so to answer the question I first posed at the start of the video, yes, the hypertrophy rep range is dead, or at least the 8 to 12 hypertrophy rep range. You can get hypertrophy anywhere between 5 to 50 or maybe even more reps and maximize the muscle growth response on any given set. So I have just blown your mind telling you you can do more than 12 reps and still grow muscle. But is there ever a case where you wouldn't want to use high rep work or where you would want to use it? Let me give you a few use cases where I think high rep work is both appropriate and maybe not so appropriate. First, a word of caution and why I think most of your training should still be in the sort of five to 15 rep range. We have conducted a scoping review on the topic of how accurate people are at gauging reps in reserve. But the long story short is that most people are pretty accurate at gauging how close to failure they really are. However, that is when they're training with relatively low reps. When people start training with more than 12 reps, their accuracy starts to break down. And at that point, it's not uncommon for people to overestimate how close to failure they were by at least a few reps. And because training relatively close to failure is important for hypertrophy, for example, a meta regression by Robinson and colleagues show that the closer you go to failure, the more hypertrophy you generally see, since that is important, if we cannot tell how close to failure we are with higher reps, that is a problem. Because even though we might get the same hypertrophy when we're taking the set to failure, it might be more difficult to take the set to failure in the first place with higher reps. And indeed, if you've ever done 20 rep sets on squats, you will know it is harder to push it to failure when you go high in reps for most people most of the time. And that's why I think maybe 50 to 70% of your training should still be in the relatively heavier rep ranges, even when you're training for hypertrophy of between about five to 12 reps perhaps. However, here is use case number one for high rep ranges. When you're training for hypertrophy and you want to maximize hypertrophy, including some higher rep work in your program, is probably a wise decision. As I mentioned, the meta-analysis by Robinson showed that potentially there was an edge in terms of muscle growth to including a variety of rep ranges. If nothing else, it makes your training more fun and on the off chance there is a meaningful amount of fiber type specific hypertrophy from different rep ranges, it covers you in that regard as well. Another use case is when you're dealing with pain. Oftentimes in my coaching experience and my personal experience, if I'm dealing with pain in a certain joint, going higher in terms of reps and dropping the load can allow me to still train that muscle group pretty effectively. Another one is if you're traveling. If you're traveling and you only have your body weight or maybe you have a resistance band, oftentimes you will be constrained to doing high reps if you want to get sufficiently close to failure to get an effective hypertrophy stimulus in. You might need to do 30, 50 push-ups to get close to failure. And finally, if you just prefer doing so, there's nothing wrong with training with high rep ranges, 
Just keep in mind that it might be more difficult to get all the way to failure or close to failure. Now, as far as heavier rep ranges, or essentially just doing sets of fewer reps, when might you want to use those? Well, one situation is when you're power building, or essentially trying to get both strong in these cases, you might opt to do lower rep sets of say three to eight on squats and then do higher rep sets on other movements. More broadly speaking, if you just enjoy training in the heavier rep ranges of say five to 10, feel free to mostly or even exclusively do that. Just be aware that you probably do want a variety of rep ranges if you want to optimize hypertrophy. Another use for heavier rep ranges and lower reps is movements where you find that if you go too high in reps, the target muscle at least doesn't feel like the limiting factor anymore. I know that if I do more than about 12 to 15 reps on any hip hinge movement, I will typically at least feel like I'm out of breath or my lower back is giving out first before my hamstrings do. That might be a reason to train a little bit heavier and go low in reps. Likewise, if you have relatively poor conditioning or cardiovascular fitness, you might find that you can get closer to failure, as in muscular failure, by going a little bit heavier and low in reps compared to going for super high reps all the time. That is the video that was not just 20 minutes of me excusing why I always do sets of five and nothing more because my conditioning is awful. It was a genuine look at the scientific research. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. If there's any other topics you want to see us cover, leave a comment down below. If you'd like us to handle your training and nutrition for you, or if you want to have a consultation with a team of expert coaches, check out strongbyscience.com coaching. If you want information just like this sent to your email inbox every couple of weeks, check out the new letter below. And we will see you in that next one. Goodbye.